there are great risks associated with AI. We need to take it seriously. And we need to be proactive, not reactive in thinking about policy related to, to AI. And it's not just about letting the industry kind of self-regulate. I do think there's a role for, for government, but government needs to be informed before they're able to make thoughtful decisions regarding what regulations are appropriate. That's the phase we're in now. And hopefully over the next year or two, some, some clarity will emerge that will hedge against some of the risks while still uh, kind of trying to maximize some of the opportunity. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Thanks, Susan. Uh, and welcome, everyone, to another Walker Webcast. Uh, it is a Super big pleasure for me to have uh, my friend and amazing entrepreneur, Steve Case, join me today. I'm going to do a quick bio of Steve, which really doesn't need to be read. It's, it's brief. And then I want to run a quick video that I'm going to have Susan run, and then we'll jump into our conversation. So Steve Case is an American businessman, investor, and philanthropist, and former chief executive officer and chairman of America Online. Case joined AOL's predecessor company, Quantum Computer Services, as a marketing vice president in 1985, became CEO of the company named AOL in 1991, and at its height of the dot-com in 2000, orchestrated with Jerry Levin, the merger that created AOL Time Warner. He is now chairman and CEO of Revolution. Steve hails from Hawaii and is a graduate of Williams College. So Steve, given your place in my rankings of iconic American entrepreneurs, um, I asked Susan to pull up this old Apple ad, and I just want to run it because I think it kicks off our discussion really well. So, Susan, will you run the ad, please? Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. I want to dive in to your book, Rise of the Rest, Steve, and sort of what drove you to both create the bus tours and go find those entrepreneurs, many of which you and your partners invested in. Um, but at the beginning of the book, the premise of the book and the premise of what you did was your fear that the United States will lose its role as being the entrepreneurial capital of the world, that um, as other countries invest in technology and entrepreneurship, that the U.S. might lose that position. What, what makes you think that? And do you still hold that since you started Rise of the Rest and all the work that you've done to promote entrepreneurship across the country? Well, first of all, it's great to be with you, Willie, and uh, it's 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 an amazing journey that I've had as an entrepreneur, and 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 now we have the real honor of being able to back the next generation of entrepreneurs, and as you said, not just in the usual places like like a Silicon Valley, but all over the country, and it ties in with your your question. I actually am optimistic that America can continue to lead, can continue to be the most innovative entrepreneurial nation in the world, but I don't believe we can do that if we just continue to do business as usual. We have to got to lean in the future and we have to be backing more people and also more places. You know, the last decade, if you looked at the venture capital world, about 75% of the money has gone to just three states, you know, California, New York, and Massachusetts, which means that the other, you know, 47 states are fighting over the remaining 25%. But a lot of great entrepreneurs out there with great ideas that could create some of the companies of the future, even some of the industries of the future. Uh, but we need to back them there. If we don't back them there, what you what happened, and we've seen this a lot in the last couple of decades, is sort of a brain drain of people leaving those places to go to the, the coast, go to places like Silicon Valley, because that's sort of the, the only land of opportunity. So I think we just need to remember what got us to now that, that, that ties in with the, the, the video you ran, the tribute to Steve Jobs, 
uh, that America is America because of the pioneering spirit. You know, we started, you know, really as a startup 250 years ago, and, and most people around the world didn't think America would survive, but we were pioneering, we were entrepreneurial, and we led the way in the agricultural revolution, and then led the way in the industrial revolution, and then more recently, led the way in the technology revolution, the digital revolution. And that's why we're the leader of the pack. But we have seen, as you well know, the globalization of innovation, entrepreneurship, and venture capital. When, you know, three decades ago, over 90% of global venture capital was invested in the United States. Now it's well under half. So other countries have figured out that it's sort of the, the secret sauce that's powered the American story is innovation, is entrepreneurship. And so that's why my, my call in even writing the book was to, that we double down on innovation, we double down on entrepreneurship, and we do it in a much more inclusive way, not just a few people in a few places, mostly on the coast, but everybody all across the country. And in starting AOL, you and your partners did it in Northern Virginia, uh, which isn't in one of those three VC hubs. Was there a little bit from your own experience of trying to find talent and trying to find capital of being a startup in, in Northern Virginia that also says to you, hey, I know what it's like to be the sort of forgotten space and how hard it is to find capital and people and resources. And therefore, there's a little bit of this of AOL being somewhat of an outlier as it relates to where it was started and founded and being not only well, well beyond a unicorn, a unicorn on steroids is one of the iconic in uh, technology companies that we've ever had in the United States. Was there something in all that as well? No, yeah, I'm sure there is, no question. Uh, when we started uh, in 1985, we started in, in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, Northern Virginia, outside of Washington, DC. And it wasn't a very entrepreneurial area. It wasn't, there was no startup ecosystem. There really was no venture capital. We raised in our first round $1 million. None of it came from the DC, Virginia, Maryland area. It came from New York, Toronto, Chicago, you know, San Francisco, Boston, none of it from, from, from the area. And so I think it was harder to raise capital. It was harder to take, be taken seriously. It was harder to attract talent because it was more of a traditional kind of government town, if you will. The government government contractors and, and so forth really kind of dominate the, the, the scene. So I think that that challenge, that that struggle in those early days, just to get started and you know just to have a shot, just to get on the playing field, I think did inform uh, you know my my thinking on this. But I also was asked probably not twelve or thirteen years ago to to co-chair something called the National Advisory Council on, on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And that led to a series of, of recommendations, including one that the White House, then President Obama took up the launch of an initiative called Startup America, which I was asked to, to, to chair. And that started getting me traveling around the country and also opened my eyes to two statistics that I didn't, didn't know. One was the, the issue I just mentioned around how much capital goes to places like Silicon Valley and how little capital goes to most parts of the country. But the other, which was a surprise, was that the new company, startups are essentially the big job creators in America. It's not small business, it's not big business, it's new business. And, and it, it, that surprised me because I was saying the big companies, the Fortune 500 were the you know, major job creators, but they're not. The reason for that is even though I count for a lot of jobs, some of those Fortune 500 companies are growing, but some of them are declining. And as a sector, there's not a lot of net job creation. And similarly, on the small business side, it too accounts for a lot of jobs, but it's not a lot of net new jobs because what happens there, if some small business, maybe it's a restaurant, you know, goes out of business, it likely will be taken over by another restaurant that will hire about the same number of people. So as a sector, it's not, it's not really growing jobs. So we, we can only grow jobs as a nation if we're growing jobs with new companies. And we need to be backing those companies everywhere, not just in a few places. I should say not every company, obviously, that starts and wants or even needs to raise venture capital. Some are able to figure out some way to, to bootstrap their way to success. But the overwhelming majority of the biggest companies that have been most successful, the Googles, the Teslas, the Apples, the, the Amazons, you, you name them, all did raise venture capital. And that's why figuring out ways to get venture capital to more of the entrepreneurs in places around the country is, is so important. As you think back on AOL, I, I remember distinctly in 1993 when I was a first year student at Harvard Business School and we had we had an AOL beta, all of our computers, we actually loaded up AOL and we had our first email system in 93 and used AOL and that was the first time I'd ever been introduced to it. And I went back in getting ready for this, Steve, and looked at some of both your old commercials in like 94 and 95 and then there was a clip from the Today Show where Bryant Gumbel and Katie Couric are sitting there talking and, and they're trying, Bryant Gumbel turns to Katie Couric and goes, what is this internet thing? And they've got up on the screen this at 
at, at NBC.com. And they're like, what's that at sign all about? And it's just so funny to think back that obviously for the two of us, we lived it and you lived it much more than I did. But there's such a huge portion of our population that thinks that this thing was always around and that the ability to do what we're doing right now was always there. When did you know, Steve, that AOL was going to be successful? Like it was a I'm assuming that there was this moment in time where it was kind of a struggling startup. And then all of a sudden you said, hold it, we've really got something here. Where was it in that time frame that it kind of turned from a fledgling startup into, wow, this thing's really going to be big? We were really a decade into it before we finally kind of broke through. I used to joke that we were a decade in the making overnight sensation because for when we started in 1985, nobody knew or cared about the internet. About 3% of people were online at the time. Those 3% were online at an average of one hour a week. So it's pretty, pretty fringy, kind of a limited to sort of a hobbyist market. Uh, and even when we went public, we we're the first internet company to go public in uh, 1992. Uh, at the time, we had less than 200,000 customers. I'd been at it, you know, seven, eight years at that at that point in time, and so it's still relatively small. I, I, I would point out, given your your audience, that when we went public, we raised 10 million dollars in our IPO, and the value of the company that day was 70 million dollars, which proves that nobody knew or cared what we were doing. Uh, and then, thankfully, seven years later, it's gone from 70 million to 160 billion. It was actually the best performing stock of the of the decade. So it actually is a great example of the first decade was a struggle. A couple of times we almost uh, hit the wall, had to go through layoff. It didn't look, didn't look like the company was going to survive. And the second decade is when things really started taking off. And the the moment where I really knew that things that had arrived it was sort of a weird moment because it was sort of a good news, bad news thing. But and probably is now. 1997, something like that, uh, we shifted from essentially a, a subscription model where you got a certain number of hours each each month for a certain price to re raise the price and gave people unlimited access so they, they could use as much as they wanted. As expected, uh, the usage really skyrocketed, but it skyrocketed even more than we had planned for. And as a result, our systems crashed. And AOL was down for 23 hours. Nobody could access their email or any of the things they had started to count on. So at one level, it was sort of like, whoa, we, this, is, this is bad. We've really let people down. But the positive of it was uh, it was the lead article in most newspapers around the country and the lead story on the, on the network news that AOL was down. Uh, and 10 years later, even five years later, before, nobody would have known or cared if we'd been down. For, you know, since we were kind of non-existent. So that's when I realized the internet had gone from sort of a fringy, hobbyist, niche kind of thing to more of a mainstream phenomenon. And it became something that really kind of people were starting to rely on. So, that, But that was a, more than a decade after we started. As your market cap went from $70 million to $160 billion, how how did you stay disciplined to not chase the temptations in the sense that you had so much currency to be able to go basically expand anywhere you wanted to. I'm, I'm sure you had offers to go vertically integrate into cable companies, to go into PC manufacturing. I mean, all the various ancillary services and goods that you had to interface with at AOL. How did, how did you keep the discipline on your kind of core business during that explosive growth? Well, we did do a lot of acquisitions. We did recognize we had a valuable currency and we made, I think it was 30 different acquisitions. So, so some were more niche product like MapQuest, one of the first mapping uh, software uh, companies. Some of the larger companies like Netscape uh, created the, one of the first uh, worldwide web browsers. Then later, obviously, merging with, with Time Warner, which was the you know really big merger, actually the biggest merger ever. Uh, so we definitely used our currency and recognized there was some value to that, that, that currency. But we tried to, to your point, also make sure there's a strong focus on the core business, on the on the main business. So we kind of organized the company with AOL, that core business at the at the at the center, and managed some of these acquisitions off a little bit more on the on the side. But it was was challenging for sure uh, when we when we went public. As I mentioned, we had less than two hundred thousand customers. We also had less than two hundred employees, and then seven eight years later, it was ten thousand employees. So it really became, and you know, after that slow decade, suddenly things. Were quite different, and I had to change obviously a lot of things I was I was doing, you know, delegate even more and more uh, because I just had to you know, had so much going on, particularly not just in the United States, but at that point we started expanding around the, the world. So it was very that very challenging you know, period. Uh, but I'd say some would, would say we didn't really have the discipline in terms of using our currency because we made a number of acquisitions, but we believed that was really essential to make sure we broaden our 
our portfolio of businesses broadened our platform. So it wasn't just the AOL business, but we had a, a wide a variety of other businesses as well. I remember distinctly taking my young boys to the Udvar Hazy Air and Space Museum back in the early 2000s. And you had had your holiday party at the Air and Space Museum the night before, just talking about the size and scale of AOL. And I, I remember saying distinctly, uh, to, to, to one of my sons, can you imagine having a company that would fill this place with all of your employees? It was really quite something. So and let's- five years before we were you know, renting out a little restaurant. So it just, it was a, it was a crazy time. So let's go to, to, to the rise of the rest. Um, you, you, you rented a, a bus and did eight tours. You visited yep. 43 cities. You put 11,000 miles on that, on that bus. Um, first of all, did you buy the bus or did you rent the bus? We just rented the bus. It was one of these bus companies that works with like the on, on you know music tours and even for politicians. And they basically put your 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 logo, whatever you want, on the side of the bus. So it looks like you own it, but we just would rent it for you know a week, you know, usually a couple times a month, a couple times a year. So a couple of quick questions on the bus tour before we dive into the purpose of the bus tour. First thing, most beautiful moment as it relates to was there a a sunset, a rainstorm, a vista that you saw that you just said, Wow, this is America. It was actually a number of sunsets. At the end of the day, I and mean, we'd have these long days, we'd be pretty busy, uh, I'd be pretty tired, but I'd often go to the front of the bus and sit by the, you know, the, the drivers on the foot of the steps and just watch the, the sunset. We headed down the road from one city onto the, onto the next city. And it was you know, a remarkable opportunity to connect to people in places that otherwise wouldn't have had exposure to. Uh, and every day, in part because I think I was exhausted, but also because it was just uh, getting ready for this next journey, this next chapter, this next you know city. I would often sit at the front and, and watch the sunsets, and they were they were just almost always glorious. And it was, but it wasn't, wasn't just watching the sunset; it was watching the sunset as we were rolling down the highway, headed to our next stop. And was there any personal habit that you either picked up or dropped while being on the bus, rather than flying from point to point? Well, we were stopping every night. It was a it was a kind of bus that didn't have any sleeping accommodation. So we basically would would you know drive usually two, three, four hours each night and get in pretty late. You know, some sometimes close to midnight and then start the next morning at really you know typically six or six thirty with with you know getting our next events you know kind of kind of going. Uh, so some of it was just trying to make sure that I I got as much sleep as I could when I was when I was on these these trips and also packed pretty lightly. So I would basically you know, like grab one shirt and, you know, kind of change your clothes essentially to go up to the hotel room as opposed to packing and unpacking each time. I'm not sure I've fully carried that forward in, in my more recent years, but I, I do pack a little more lightly than I did before I started doing these bus tours. So as I mentioned, you did eight of them, you visited 43 cities. And after all of that, you made 200 investments in 100 companies, uh, sorry, 200, invest, 200 investments in 200 companies in 100 cities. And, and that struck me, Steve, as odd, because I would have thought that you would have had more concentration of investments in specific cities or hubs where, as you point out in the book, very in great detail, and it actually reminded me of Michael Porter's five forces analysis of, you know, you need clusters. You, you, you don't just need a great entrepreneur like yourself. You don't just need the capital. You also need universities. You need um, uh, sort of incubators slash facilitators. Um, you need local and regional and in some instances, national government help to make all this come together. And so the fact that you invested in 200 companies in 100 cities surprised me. I thought it would have been 200 companies in 20 cities. Well, it's a, it's a fair point, but we wanted to prove that there really are great entrepreneurs building companies in cities that most people wouldn't take very seriously. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. A couple of weeks ago, I was in you know, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and, and most people don't think of that as a, as a startup city. If anything, in the area, probably people would think maybe Nashville or Atlanta, but Chattanooga wouldn't, wouldn't make the cut if you're just picking, say, 20, 20 hubs. But actually, they have a, 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 a really strong startup culture there. They, for the most of the past decade, have had the, had the highest speed uh, broadband in the country, which is kind of interesting. And they also have really building on their legacy around uh, expertise around freight logistics. A lot of the big trucking companies in America are headquartered in, in Chattanooga. So the company we backed there, Freightways, which has built a sort of a Bloomberg data platform for the trucking and logistics industry, is based there and, and having great success there. Another example is in Fayetteville, Arkansas, also wouldn't have made the cut if you just were picking 
you know, 20, the company we back there, Acre Trader, is sort of an investment platform where people want to invest in farmland, want to diversify their holdings by investing in farmlands, which is easy if you're quite wealthy, but it's hard for most people. And the process also get capital of farmers so they can they can uh, expand. And that founder actually was in San Francisco when he had the idea for Acre Trader and decided to move to Arkansas because it's a two-sided marketplace and it wouldn't be successful without getting the farmers on board. They thought it'd be you know, build, more likely to build a rapport and trust and get more farmers to, to support what they're trying to do at Acre Trader if they were in, in Arkansas. So they moved to Fayetteville. So those are some of the examples of cities that wouldn't make the cut. But in fairness, of the 200 investments, there is some clustering. There are definitely some some cities that where we have a handful of investments, sometimes six or eight investments. So it's not just one or two across 100 cities. There's often one investment in some of the smaller cities and then really a, a handful in some of the, the, the larger cities. But the main point is that entrepreneurs can start and scale companies now anywhere, even more so post pandemic, where there's more flexibility in terms of, of how people can you know, live and work. And they're building on expertise in, in sectors that where we're having that domain expertise, having that trust and having relationships really is helpful. Freightways in Chattanooga is able to do that. Uh, we've seen that in health tech with the cities like uh, Baltimore, Maryland, because of Johns Hopkins, also Under Armour being headquartered there. What's happening with in Cleveland around the Cleveland Clinic, Clinic or MD Anderson in Texas or Mayo Clinic and in Minnesota. Some of these cities are not necessarily the cities that you were just saying, instead of just focusing on San Francisco, New York, and Boston, let's pick 20 others. These wouldn't make the cut, but really interesting things are happening there. So, and, I, and that to me is the main takeaway from, from the book. Most people have been doing interviews say, okay, I, I get Silicon Valley, I get New York City's really growing, I get bio, you know, biotech in, in Boston is pretty, pretty strong. What are the next one or two cities that are going to rise? And it's not one or two cities, it's really several dozen cities. And our investment strategy is really trying to prove that out. That yes, some clustering makes sense. Uh, but also building on domain expertise and, and specific cities also makes sense. So you, you point out Chattanooga, and one of the things you highlight in the book is that Chattanooga took TARP funds and not only created one of the best fiber optic networks in the country, which you just mentioned, but also a smart grid. Uh, and, and I would have thought, Steve, that as you traveled across the country, there would have been, if you will, more companies that were leveraging off of the physicality, if you will. So uh, a, a, a greenhouse operator who's in Denver, Colorado, because there are 300 days of sunlight in Colorado, um, a big user of water on the St. Lawrence Seaway, because you've got access to lots of, you know, fresh water and an abundance of water rather than starting the company in Phoenix, Arizona. But it seemed like from having read up on all the investments you made that it, that it, that it wasn't really the, 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 the physical infrastructure, if you will, or access to natural resources or, or trucking lanes for that matter. And it was more a combination of the people, the capital, the incubators and the local universities like you just talked about, um, of Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, for instance, um, that actually are what drove the entrepreneurial success less than the actual physical location. Is that, am, I, am I stating that right? And, and did, you see any, did, you, did you see any that actually did leverage off of the physical location, if you will, as it relates to access to the, to the natural environment? Well, I think, yeah, absolutely we did. And, and, and even some of the companies I mentioned, like, a, a, like a Freight Waves is building on what's unique about that particular city. It's not necessarily natural resources, but it is a core competency of it. It's it known as sort of the freight alley. A lot of trucks go through that, the Chattanooga area. But another example uh, that is more specific to your, to your point is a company called App Harvest that we backed in Eastern Kentucky, which built what's now, I think, the largest indoor greenhouse in America. And they did it in part because their location outside of Lexington, Kentucky, about 70% of the US population is within a 24 hour drive. And they also designed it to use 90% less water. And we're starting to see real, real challenges with water, including this, this week, a, you know, kind of a, a deal was cut in terms of how some of the water from the Colorado River is shared around Arizona, California, some of these other states. There's a real battle over water. Agriculture is a key part of that. And, and farmers need to figure out ways to, to, to grow more food, but use less water. And App Harvest is an, an example of that taking advantage of their their unique location. The other interesting thing about App Harvest is that area where they are is known as Appalachia, coal country, which for decades really has been in decline. So seeing companies start and scale there, and App Harvest now has, I think, about a thousand employees, uh, gives people in those areas a little bit more of a sense of hope and possibility, which also I think is, is important. It goes back to your early kind of first question, how does America continue to 
lead the way, be the most innovative entrepreneurial nation in, in the world. We talked about some of that. The other thing we need to do is to do it in a way that's more inclusive so people don't feel left out and left behind. A lot of people, and you see this play out in our politics, a lot of people in this country do feel left out and left behind. That's not all about economics and jobs, but that's part of what it's about. And creating more new companies in these cities that can grow and create jobs in these cities is important. And the final point is it's not just the jobs these new companies are creating. The data is basically says for every job in a new company, there's five other jobs in the community. And I saw this when AOL was growing and suddenly we're adding, you know, thousands of people. Suddenly home builders in the Northern Virginia area were, were, were booming and, and you know, restaurants were opening and schools were opening and roads were being built. There's a broader ripple effect across the community. Conversely, when you're not doing that, and this is the, the story of, of Detroit, which 100 years ago sort of was Silicon Valley, it sort of was the most innovative city in America, it was the fifth largest city in America, one of the fastest growing cities in America because everybody wanted to be part of the car revolution. And then over a, a half a century, lost 60% of its population. And the year before we rolled in with our rise in red bus, the city of Detroit went bankrupt. So that gives you a sense of you know, what happens when you lose that entrepreneur mojo, you lose that, uh, that, that new job creation from, from, uh, from, uh, from new company. Now, the, the final point on, on Detroit, the good news there is we've now backed a handful of companies, including Shinola and StockX, both have created more than a thousand jobs in, in, in Detroit and are, are quite successful you know, companies. So they're turning the corner because they're doubling down again on new companies, on startups, on, on entrepreneurs. Yeah, you, you, the, 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 I was going to mention the StockX one um, as it relates to, well, first of all, you talk extensively in the book about how important Dan has been to the, to the revitalization of Detroit and what, what Quicken and Quicken Loans have done to that community and Dan Gilbert's personal investment, not only in the company, but in real estate and then attracting investors like yourself to come into the Detroit and back companies like Shinola, like StockX, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I thought it was interesting, Steve, in the book where you talked about the Rust Belt and that, that you know, when you pointed out the fact that talking about cities that are in the Rust Belt and particularly Pittsburgh is, is really kind of a derogatory term to use for them because it's basically saying you're rusty and you're never going to have a future. And universities like Carnegie Mellon have done so much to invest in that community. And I guess that loops back to those those seven spokes that you talk about in the flywheel to creating an entrepreneurial culture of whether it's you know, universities, the incubators, the, the government, um, access to capital. Is there one, Steve, that as you traveled to all these cities that if you didn't have it, you didn't have the others? I mean, do, like, I'm sure you went to places that had, you know, an entrepreneurial culture, access to capital, but that the government's kind of holding it back or somewhere else where the government's kind of all in, but it doesn't have the other component parts. Was Is there one that you say, if you don't have that from either local leadership or whatever, you just can't get the ecosystem going? Well, I would I'd say if you try to narrow it down to what are the most essential ingredients, I'd say it's talent and capital. Uh, because the university obviously can, can help a, a great deal. Government setting the rules can help a, a great deal. Startup support organizations can help a great deal. All the things that, that, you, that you mentioned, but they have to build on the core of, of, of talent. They have people with ideas and the ability for those ideas to take flight by having access to that early stage angel seed capital to, 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 to get going. Uh, and that goes back to what we talked about before, because in many parts of the country, there isn't that capital that has led for decades to this brain drain where a lot of people do leave where they, they grew up or went to school because they don't think the opportunity is there. They feel like they have to leave to go to someplace else, often the coast, often Silicon Valley, because that's really where you know, the capital is. And because that's where the capital is, that's where the other people who are, want to be part of the innovation economy have tended to, you know, to, to congregate. So slowing the brain drain of people leaving and actually creating a boomerang of people returning is, is really quite critical. And we've been talking about that for, for a decade. One of the things that was helpful uh, with the pandemic, and I mentioned this before, was it, it, what, it did lead to more of that boomerang. Some people did decide to leave some of those coastal cities and, and go back to where they grew up or go back to school, maybe a city where they went to school. They thought that, that maybe they had more flexibility to work uh, remotely and because of this you know, kind of birth of more hybrid organizations, some cases even remote only uh, kind of uh, 
uh, organizations. That's created a dynamic where the, the talent flows, I think, are moving in a much more positive direction, reversing what's been a several decade you know, brain drain. And the capital piece, we're also seeing progress. Still work to be done, but in the last decade, about 1,400 new venture capital firms have started in these rise of the rest cities outside of the big hub, San Francisco, New York, and Boston, 1,400. And these tend to start pretty small in terms of being you know, seed funds or angel funds or early stage venture funds. But obviously, when they're successful, they can expand and become larger funds. And having more capital in these cities that are close to where these entrepreneurs are, I think, will catalyze more startups. And then what will happen, we started seeing this already, is the coastal funds will start paying attention once the companies have have scaled and are moving into the venture, or particularly the growth uh, stage. So I think those those two things are critically important. The last thing I'd say, which is why we talk about in the book, the ecosystem wheel, the other critical ingredient is actually collaboration. It's not just thinking about what's possible in each part of this this ecosystem, but how things can work together in a much more collaborative way. One of the surprises in terms of, and disappointments, frankly, in visiting so many cities is how fragmented, siloed so many cities are, where interesting things are happening, but people often in those own cities don't really know about it, and they're not working together very effectively to, to really collaborate. And that's one of the great things about Silicon Valley, what we call network density. There's a you know, density of, of, of people working together to, to build companies. We need to create more of that network density uh, in these cities, and we also need to create more of that network density across these cities, which is why in revolution with, with our Rise and Rest initiative, we host a lot of summit just about three or four weeks ago. We hosted a summit in Washington, D.C. called Beyond Silicon Valley, where 170 regional venture capital firms joined us for, for a couple of days. A couple of months ago, we hosted a, an entrepreneur forum for, for about 200 uh, CEOs in, in, in Phoenix, Arizona. We're really trying to really create an, an environment in each city we visit to drive more collaboration and also create a broader network across the, across the country. Yeah, I, you know, as I read the book, Steve, I was I was sort of having this a little bit of a of a struggle, if you will, in the sense that you point out so clearly the need for the collaboration, the communication. You talk about experiences on the bus, off the bus, sitting around with local leaders, both governmental as well as university, as well as um, incubators, and how all of that drove what you got to see and the success of your investments and your competitions and all of that. And yet at the same time, you also talk about how the pandemic accelerated the dispersion of both capital and talent and allowed people to go and kind of work remotely. And, you know, you're in a hotel in California today. I'm in a hotel in Miami today. We're able to both do this and have it on our schedule. We don't have to be sitting at our desk and doing what we're doing. And obviously being in the commercial real estate space, this back to the office issue is a very significant one in everyone's minds. But I I hear you talk about it and it sort of says, yeah, the future is this kind of hybrid of being able to use the technology to find opportunities, communicate with one another, but then there is nothing like that collaboration to you saying like, I arrived in the city and everyone siloed up and until we became the conveners, until you had your conference a couple of weeks ago, there are people who are sitting there and they can't make that connection if they're sitting on Zoom calls, just talking to the people that they actually usually interact with. I agree with that. And I I think that most companies will have some physicality to them, but we have back some companies that are remote only and they start from day one, building a, a culture around that, building technologies to, to support uh, kind of collaboration and do tend to get together periodically every two or three months where they all gather in a particular place uh, to make sure they do have that, that you know, connection. We also back a number of companies, including a number of uh, Rise and Rest uh, cities that are fully in the office five days a week. You know, they, they like working together, you know, often benefit from shorter commutes, sometimes even walkable uh, communities where they can walk to work and they just prefer being uh, in, in person and people are there five days a week. Uh, and then there are obviously a lot in the middle, which are you know trying to figure out what what their version of hybrid is, three days, two days, you know that sort of thing. So I think what what's happened has been a, a unlock in terms of this idea that companies have to be in the office five days a week. Uh, the idea that entrepreneurs have to be in in Silicon Valley. Exactly how this plays out over the next you know five or ten years, I think is unclear. I think there'll be different examples of, 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 of things that can be successful with these different models. But I think there likely will be more in-person connectivity for, 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 for most companies. If you think about this this, uh, this next chapter, I agree with your 
your point that that you can Zoom works quite well if you're you know if you know what you need to do and are very task oriented uh, and you and, and and obviously some tasks like engineering people often can be even more effective working remotely where there's fewer distractions. But a lot of the creativity, collaboration, you know, outside the box thinking happens, in, you know, through you know, kind of almost accidental serendipitous collisions, and those are much harder to do in in, in, in Zoom than they are in in a physical place. As I think about all the entrepreneurs that you met on this long bus tour, um, and you made two hundred investments, I think to uh, a couple of things come to mind, and I'd love your your insight into it. The first one is, as you're talking about some companies being fully remote and other companies having everyone in the office every single day, um, there's there's got to be something in the entrepreneurial capabilities of an entrepreneur that say to you, hey, that's amazing that he or she can manage their company completely remotely and not everyone together. Or my bias is towards because you might go back to AOL in the early days when everyone being around the bullpen talking about things was what you saw made AOL move from, you know, a fledgling startup into a $160 billion corporation. Um, and it, it reminds me, Steve, of, of I, I wrote a note to, to Guy Raz, who's the, the host of NPR's How I Built This. And I said to him, you know, from having listened to lots of episodes here, when I think of how you built this, it's like how you built AOL into this massive company and to a much lesser degree, but how I built Walker and Dunlop of kind of like methodically step by step. And the stories on how I built this are always seemingly these entrepreneurs who got to the brink of bankruptcy and had mortgaged their home and and had like, you know, had all this destruction in their life. And then all of a sudden something just clicks that makes them have this idea that just takes off. The market shifted. They got a they got an order from somebody. But that's obviously the excitement of his show. But I don't view that as how I built this as far as a long, sustainable company. I see it as your idea has sort of caught caught fire. You're in the venture business, but you're also in the private equity business. When you look at founders and leaders of companies that you're investing in, is there a different filter for the entrepreneurial look than for the builder of business look? Well, a bunch of things there. First of all, I want to go back to what we were talking about before around uh, office. Another another thing that came out of our Ride the Rest bus tour is it might be of interest, uh, given I know a lot of your audience is interested in uh, commercial real estate, is we saw in the different cities that we were traveling to, uh, neighborhoods that were emerging where entrepreneurs were clustering, almost innovation districts in these in these neighborhoods. Uh, and we saw it also as a real estate opportunity. It wasn't our real focus uh, because we were focused on investing in companies. So we encourage other people, Blackstone and others, to launch kind of rise the rest strategies around these cities. Uh, and because we could identify which cities were on the rise, we could identify which neighborhoods were on the rise, uh, but you know, it didn't get a lot of traction. And then about five or six years ago, we were approached by Heinz, which is a you know real estate de developer with a regional focus about potentially doing a joint venture together around Rise the Rest, and talked about that for a few months, but didn't work for a variety of reasons. And two of the people, including the chief strategy officer at Heinz, joined us at Revolution, and we launched a real estate effort where we've invested in initially in some mixed use, more recently some some multifamily in these rising cities, and we're seeing a lot of opportunity there. So I'd encourage folks who are listening, if they're not focusing on these rise the rest cities, it's not just about opportunities to invest in companies, it's also an opportunity to invest in these cities in terms of the, the real estate platforms and neighborhoods that can drive a lot of this uh, collaboration. In terms of your your, your second question, I, I really do think that entrepreneurship spirit, you can, you can often tell when you're meeting entrepreneurs that they're looking things in a different context, but they also have a plan of attack and not just an, an idea. So I love this quote from Thomas Edison, vision without execution is hallucination. They have a, a battle plan. They have a, a sense of how they're going to go about this. They've started to assemble a team because we've all learned that entrepreneurship is a, is a team sport. And sometimes we focus too much on the, the CEO, the founding entrepreneur, and not enough on the, the teams. And they often also have a strategy around partnerships, which I think in this next 10 or 20 years is going to be critically important. I don't think you're going to be successful in healthcare or food and ag or many of these other uh, sectors unless you have a bias towards partnership because this requires systems level change. And healthcare, for example, it's a big opportunity. One sixth of the economy, it's kind of messed up. It's it's not very convenient for consumers, not very affordable. Outcomes often aren't that very aren't that good. So you need some systems level change. You need some reimagination. But that's not about writing some code. That's right about creating software 
software that can create some some change and then getting doctors to use it and nurses to use it and hospitals to pay for it and and health plans to embrace it the, the whole the whole thing needs to be integrated in order to have systems level change and that bias towards partnerships is also important so when we're talking to entrepreneurs and obviously it's a little different when it's a very early stage seed investment versus a venture investment versus a later stage kind of pre-IPO growth investment. You know, the questions are a little different, the dynamics are a little different, but what's common are entrepreneurs who don't just have an idea, but really have a plan to put that idea into action. I thought one of the really interesting things, Steve, was that the investments that you made weren't just technology investments. Like there's a water testing company that you invested in called 120 Water, which it was based in Indianapolis, Indiana, but saw the water contamination that happened in Flint, Michigan and said, you know, there's got to be a way to, the, the, the entrepreneur went to get a home test for her water and couldn't find one and said, there's an opportunity here, let's go do it. And um, it, it's interesting to me that there, and then you also talk about, you know, your comment on real estate, you also talked about some of these amazing community leaders, people who started restaurants, people who started grocery stores that, that transform segments of these cities that you traveled into. And they're just as entrepreneurial as you know, someone who's creating a, 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 a software company, except their concept isn't as scalable. And so obviously it's harder to get venture capital into their concept. But I, I thought one of the great parts about the book was that it, it underscored entrepreneurship in a broader way than what most of us define entrepreneurship as. Well, some of that is, is this idea of, of, of tech companies or tech startups Every company is a tech company now. Every company uses technology to manage their business and to you know, you know, kind of extend their, their business. You can't pick a sector where technology is not more important now than it was you know, 10 or 20 years ago and likely going to be increasingly important 10 or 20 years from now. So that's why our lens is not just investing in, say, software, but investing in tech-enabled disruption, tech-enabled uh, in, in reimagination of these different Industries and you mentioned restaurants. A good example: a company we backed at the really relatively early stage, a company called Sweet Green, which is now a public company and quite successful in the fast casual uh, space. Uh, and they were using a lot of technology. They, they were kind of working with local farmers who used technology to connect to the farmers to build a kind of a farm to the table kind of uh, supply chain. They also use a lot of technology to interact with consumers. That sixty percent of their orders come on smartphones for either delivery or people you know, picking them up in the in, in the in the restaurants, and not wanting to you know, wait in line. So it's food. It's restaurants. But it's using a lot of technology to make that possible. And just a, about a week or ten days ago. Uh, they announced the first uh, uh, store in Naperville, uh, Illinois, which is using robot technology to create the, the, the salads. And it's really a fascinating uh, thing that they're doing that people should take a look at some of the, the videos on. So again, most people would see that as a restaurant concept, a food concept. Now, what are tech investors who have an internet background doing investing in a company like that? Well, they're using a lot of technology to reimagine an industry. We believe that the fast food industry or segment would give way to the fast casual segment, which is starting to happen. We also believe healthier options would, would give way to you know, would knock out some of the unhealthy options. That's starting to happen. And that thesis seven or eight years ago led us to invest in Sweet Green when it was a small company, and now it's a, a much uh, larger company, like four hundred million dollars of, of, of revenue because they use technology. I think you're going to see more and more of those opportunities for tech-enabled, you know, kind of companies in this in this next uh, decade or so. Talk about an entrepreneur named Cameron Johnson who um, is in the real estate space. Worked for a, a big client of Walker Dunlop's, Great Star. Um, and one of the things you highlight in the book, Steve, is you say that Cameron kept seeing people who wanted to rent the model unit. And it's so funny because, as you can imagine, I've toured a thousand model units. And, and I've also often walked in and been like, hey, you know, I could live here. This is kind of cool. And the fact that you can't actually rent the model unit is what gave Cameron the idea to go out and create Nixon. Talk, talk about Nixon for a moment. And, and again, this isn't that sexy. It's not a software company. And at the same time, Cameron found an opportunity. And, and one of the things I also thought was really interesting and a huge you know, uh, tip of the hat to you and to Rise of the Rest is that you know, Cameron, who was an HBS grad and won the HBS Venture Prize, said that winning your competition was a massive credentialing for Nixon and the business concept that he'd created. 
Yeah, it was, it was a great for Tammy to say that. I appreciate that. And I think we do recognize we have a, a, a role to play responsibility to not just invest in these companies, but champion these companies. And in some of these cities where people in those cities tend to be a little more cautious, risk adverse around entrepreneurs, the fact that we're investing in the company and they want a pitch competition helps to elevate their stature and helps them attract people that join the company, helps them attract you know, customers, help them attract uh, other, other investors. So we're, we're, we're well aware that it's not just what we're doing directly, but some of the broader impacts we have. But going back to the, the Nixon story, yeah, exactly the way you described it. He, he noticed that people wanted to rent the, what was there, but that wasn't really an option. So he created a company that essentially can do that, that people can, can essentially rent a full package of, of furniture art the whole shebang uh, on a you know at like like they rent an apartment so they can rent it for a year and if they went after the end of the year they decide to move another apartment or move to another city they turn the keys they're done so it creates a, a great level of convenience for for the the, the customer also helps the the, uh, the the owners of those assets, you know, in this case, the apartments, uh, be able to, to maximize the, the essentially the, the prices they can you know, get for these these units. So it's sort of a win-win. And we've done other things in what some people call the prop tech space, companies like Placemaker and Mint House that are working with, with you know, buildings, office buildings, apartment buildings to figure out new ways to manage that uh, that inventory. So those are, again, examples of tech-enabled disruption of what some think is as a as a non-tech business, but we you know, recognize that this collision between technology, innovation, and, and, and other sectors is important. In some ways, we're entering what I've called the third wave of the internet, which is when the internet meets the real world. And it means the real world in terms of you know, where, where and how we live and how we move around and how we, how we invest and what we eat and, and how we stay healthy, how we learn. All these things are up for grabs in this next era. And the technology obviously is going to be a critical part of it. But many other aspects need to come into play in terms of the company building. You talked about the bus tour and Rise of the Rest, focusing on, if you will, the democratization of access to capital and investing in entrepreneurs in cities that typically wouldn't have um, access to all that you brought. You also point out in the book, Steve, that there's, um, as it relates to minorities, which Cameron is one of, that only 1% of venture capital goes to minority sponsored businesses and less than 10% of venture capital goes to companies started by women. Um, and um, clearly there are plenty of minority as well as female entrepreneurs who are deserving of investment in them. It, it, it reminds me of, uh, I had Julia Borston who wrote a book called When Women Lead on the Walker webcast a couple months ago. And one of the stats that she pointed out, I think it was by the Kaufman Foundation, that female run companies have exactly the same success rate at raising series B financing as male led companies, but a fraction of the amount of male-led companies on the Series A, in other words, the first pitch. What what can women and minorities do to have a, if you will, a better a better batting average on that first pitch? Well, it's not just what they can do; it's what we can all do. That part of the challenge there is a lot of uh, people don't have access to venture capital, access to seed or angel investors. They themselves don't have money. Their family doesn't necessarily have money. So that early friends and family round, they don't have friends and family that. That have money. So how do you give them a connectivity, sort of on-ramp to people who make those investments? And that carries through in terms of the later stage investment as well. The reason why the Series B, the later stage, tends to work better uh, for female founders, founders of color, is by then the company has established itself, has a track record, it already has some initial investors and is raising a subsequent round. That's still harder for them, but it's easier than it is in the early stages. And it's not that they're not pitching it right, it's that they don't have the opportunity in many cases to, to pitch it. And that's why when we travel around, we're, we're trying to have make sure we have a broad aperture, not just in terms of thinking about place, but also thinking about people, making sure that when we do pitch competitions in different cities, it is a diverse mix of founders that reflects the, the community. And frankly, many of the communities we're visiting, Atlanta, Baltimore, cities like that are more diverse. And not surprisingly, if you have a more diverse community, you're also going to find more diverse founders. But it takes work. It takes intentionality. I think some we're making a little progress there, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So you just mentioned the third wave. You wrote a book on it, uh, the Internet basically interacting with our lives. And you talk in this book about the fact that the pandemic accelerated the third wave. Talk for a moment about the third wave. And then my question would be, is AI the fourth wave or is AI part of the third wave? Well, the, the, the way I think about the, the three waves, I should first say that when I was in college, which was now uh, 
four decades, more than four decades ago, I read a book called The Third Wave by a futurist that some of you may know, Alvin Toffler. And I found that inspirational because it, it set me on the path to, to do what I did with AOL and help, you know, kind of help create the internet, help make it mainstream. And so when I was writing the, 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 my first book, I decided to, to use that title and pay tribute to him. Thankfully, he was still alive at, at, at the time, and I was able to you know, talk to him about it, even uh, have him, uh, kind of read an advanced copy of it. Uh, but I had a different version of the third wave. You know, my, my version was the focus on the internet. So the first wave was getting America online, getting the world online. It goes back to what we said at the very beginning when it went from nobody knowing or caring about the internet to everybody being part of it. That, that meant the servers and the on-ramps and the modems and the software and all the reason to get online and the ability to get online. That was really, you know, most of the 80s and 90s were that first wave of the internet. In the last couple of decades, the, the second wave is really build, building software apps on top of the internet. The infrastructure is there, so you didn't have to build the infrastructure, you just built on top of the infrastructure. And Google and Facebook and, and obviously many other iconic companies have emerged in that, in that software-centric second wave. The third wave is, as again, we talked about earlier, when the internet meets the real world and you're starting to disrupt some big sectors of the economy and important aspects of our lives. And what's interesting and led me to write that book is some of the lessons from the first wave that weren't all that relevant in the second wave are becoming relevant again in the, in the, in the third wave. And the notion of partnerships, we've talked about it, was critically important in that in the early days. We couldn't have been successful. We had 200 partners, PC manufacturers, modems companies, software companies, media companies. Everybody had to do their part to essentially stand up the internet. That wasn't as clear in the, in the, in the second wave. Companies like uh, Facebook and, and others didn't really need partnerships. They were able to launch an app that took off virally and they were you know, kind of overnight had a pretty significant business. And the third wave and the sectors up for grabs, partnerships are going to become more important. And the other is policy. In the early days of the internet, that early first wave, it was still illegal when we got started in 1985 for consumers or businesses to be on the internet. It was restricted to government agencies and educational institutions. So we had to commercialize the internet. We had to get Congress to pass legislation that allow consumers and businesses to get on the internet. We had to do a lot of things in terms of the, the rules of road, child safety, e-commerce taxes, a bunch of things had to be thought through in that, in that early days of, of that, 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 the internet, the, the first wave. Similarly, in the third wave, policy is going to be front and center again because the sectors up for grab tend to be regulated, healthcare, food, things like that. And also some of the technologies, including what you mentioned, AI, they create some you know, challenging issues, opportunities that we should take advantage of, but also some risks that we need to kind of manage and, and hedge against. So some entrepreneurs, I know in some places that I don't want to deal with the government, but in, in, this, in this new world we're in and, and you know, it'll be, become even more clear in the next 10 or 20 years, you know, government is a player, and I think needs to be a player on issues such as AI. So you, you mentioned some of the risks on, on AI in the book. When you're talking about Carnegie Mellon and how Carnegie Mellon University came to be, you talk about the endowment that Andrew Carnegie set up to create the Carnegie Institute that then merged with Mellon. But one of the things that you raised there is that uh, Andrew Carnegie had a, had, a, had a statement of embrace your fears. Um, and uh, you use that as kind of the underpinning of Carnegie Mellon and why Carnegie Mellon has been such an advanced university as it relates to investing in robotics and technology and other things of that nature. Help me, Steve, embrace my fears as it relates to AI. I have been, I, I, I had Mo Gadot, who was the COO of Google X on the Walker webcast on his book, uh, Scary Smart, and to be perfectly blunt about it, Mo scared the heck out of me and everyone else who listened to that Walker webcast as it relates to the power of AI and why he left Google X to write his book. Um, and there, there clearly is a lot of the unknown out there. You are as insightful a technologist as I will talk to. Uh, does AI excite you, scare you, or something in between? That's clearly above. It excites me and scares me. And so it, it, like, like any new technology, this has a particularly robust set of, of, of capabilities. How do you maximize the benefits and, and minimize to kind of hedge against some of, some of the risks? And, and the, the risks are very clear. And on, at least on this one, unlike some other things, I give governments, not just in this country, but around the world, credit for recognizing there's some challenges. Even just last week, there was a hearing in 
and in, in, in Congress with Sam Altman of OpenAI and other people you know, testifying a couple of weeks before there was a, a meeting at the White House with the with the, you know, the White House team and some of the leaders in AI. So there's people are in the phase of recognizing it is important, also recognizing it's super complicated and they need to get up to speed before they can be thoughtful about any kind of regulations. But but people are focusing on it, recognizing that it does create some uh, very interesting set of, 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 of challenges that we need to, to deal with and, and threats that we need to deal with. On the positive side, the reason I, I, I'm on balance optimistic, it has the potential to do amazing things. One of the companies we backed in Chicago called Tempest has used AI to save people's lives. The, the founder, Eric Lefkowski's wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. He was a successful entrepreneur, so he was able to talk to a bunch of people and pretty much everybody talked to said they should do something different. And that's kind of scary. It was sort of, he concluded that was a data problem and his wife's life was hanging in balance. So started this company uh, to, to basically aggregate data including uh, data from a number of hospitals, I think about 2,000 hospitals now contribute to their, their data set uh, to, to allow a much more personalized diagnosis if you have cancer or other kinds of diseases that lead to a much more specific personalized intervention in terms of the, what the, you know, the therapy uh, should be. That company is saving lives and it's only possible because of, of AI. Even more recently with the pandemic, some of the work around vaccines, people were surprised by how quickly vaccines came to market. Part of that was because Moderna was using AI to really expedite discovering what was what was working and what wasn't working, which allowed them to bring to market a, a, a vaccine. We also have the opportunity to use AI in education, other sectors in ways that could be very helpful. So I see great benefits of, of AI, but I also see great risks. And I think we need to bring the right balance, being optimistic about it, not just focusing on the, on the downside, but also not being kind of... Uh, Pollyannish about it. There are great risks associated with AI. We need to take it seriously and we need to be proactive, not reactive in thinking about policy related to, to AI. And it's not just about letting the industry kind of self-regulate. I do think there's a role for, for government, but government needs to be informed before they're able to make thoughtful decisions regarding what regulations are appropriate. That's the phase we're in now. And hopefully over the next year or two, some, some clarity will emerge that will hedge against some of the risks while still uh, kind of trying to maximize some of the opportunity. So my final question, Steve, we've talked about venture uh, during this call, uh, but at Revolution, you invest everywhere. You invest in the public markets, you invest in private equity, you invest in real estate, uh, you invest in venture. As your team sits around and says, right now, May of 2023, we sort of like this and we're not loving this. Give us a what, what. What do you like right now in this environment? What do you What are you steering clear of right now in this environment, given the breadth of your overall investment portfolio? Well, we are mostly focused on the on the the venture stage, the seed, venture, and growth stage. So early stage companies before they go public, before they're profitable, really is our, our, our primary focus. We do have some other efforts I mentioned, such as, such as real estate, but that's sort of our spot. And I, I, I'm actually not surprised we've seen this market reset a couple of years ago. I was concerned about valuation. They, they did strike me as being you know, kind of frothy. So we actually pulled back on some of our later stage investments to look to, to accelerate some of the monetization of some of those investments because it did feel like things had kind of gotten out of hand. There were, there were a number of firms that were, you know, that, that really were uh, trying to get into companies, didn't believe entry valuation mattered. They just wanted to get in these companies. And it was, it was, a, it was just it struck me as, as a little bit bizarre. So the fact that the market is correct, the public markets and now the private markets have, have corrected or are correcting, I think it makes a lot of sense. And since I've been doing this for a while, it doesn't really uh, surprise me. It now creates opportunities to invest that maybe didn't exist a couple of years ago. So we're enthusiastic about this next chapter. It goes back to some of the things we're talking about. We believe the two mega trends that are really what's driving our thinking at, at Revolution. One is around place, you know, kind of focused on ride the rest. It, we, you know, we, we tend, tend to not focus on Silicon Valley because that's where everybody else is focused on. And we're focused on the other places, which is where we think some of the big companies of tomorrow will be birthed. So place, I think, is a, a real mega trend. And the other is policy for the reasons we mentioned. We think being headquartered in Washington, D.C., having a pretty good understanding of how policy you know, make, you know, works and a pretty good network, we can be helpful to companies and, and across these different sectors where policy is increasingly important. And oh, by the way, people haven't been paying attention 
Our government last year passed $3 trillion, maybe more than $3 trillion of investment in the innovation economy around things like decarbonization and reshoring and things like the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act, which also funds some regional hubs, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. So I think investors who are not paying attention to that are going to miss out on opportunities. So I would urge people to, if they're interested in investing, not just on the venture side, but also on the real estate side, look at these rising cities that what's happening there is really quite phenomenal. Think about place more as you think about your investment strategies and also recognize that policy is becoming you know, much more of a front and center issue. You've seen that in last year on the crypto space where things people thought it was you know, who are very enthusiastic suddenly realize governments were going to intervene and take some action. You're starting to see that with the discussion we just had around AI. You know, government is going to play more of a role because healthcare, because education, because food, because financial services, because transportation are such core parts of our society and are tend to be regulated sectors. So the innovators of the future need to understand that, respect that, and engage with policymakers, not, not run from them. So that would be my, my recommendation. That's certainly what we're doing at Revolution. We've really centered our strategy around uh, place and on policy. Steve, thank you. It's, uh, it's been super fun. It's an honor to have you on. Uh, great to see you. Look forward to seeing you next time I'm in DC and you're there. And uh, just greatly appreciate you taking an hour to talk about your great book, Rise of the Rest. Thank you, Willie. It's great being with you. I hope to see you on the road. Our next Rise of the Rest bus tour. Uh, um, you invite me and I'm showing up on the bus. You just let me know All where. Right. It'd be great. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day. You too.